Chapter 12, verse 13 Bearing no animosity toward any being, amiable as well as compassionate, free of eye, free of mind, holding pain and pleasure as equal, forgiving, as always satisfied with a controlled nature of firm resolve, a yogi who has surrendered his mind and intelligence unto me, who is my devotee, he is my beloved. He from whom the world does not become excited and he who does not become excited from the world, liberated from the agitations or exhilaration, intolerance and fear, he is my beloved. Free of expectation, pure, dexterous, neutral, free of insecurities, he who renounces expectations of fruits from all acts that he initiates. Who is my devotee? He is my beloved. He who neither rejoices nor hates, neither grieves nor desires, he who renounces all that is attractive or unattractive, whosoever is endowed with devotion, he is my beloved. Alike toward foe or friend, similar toward honor or dishonor, alike toward heat and cold, as well as pain and pleasure, devoid of attachment, equal to praise and censure, maintaining silence, satisfied with whatever, homeless, with stable intelligence, whosoever is endorsed with devotion, that man is my beloved. Those who follow this virtuous nectar of immortality that I have taught, maintaining faith, holding me supreme, Whose devotees are those devotees are my deeply beloved. Who is the most beloved of the Lord? Who is the chosen one? The Upanishads say the self chooses the self. That means we cannot really choose, it is our nature, we evolve, but there is an adhikari, a student, a seeker that is the favorite one, the beloved of the Lord. What does he seem to be like? These verses give a detailed description of such a beloved student or seeker. Is this beloved or this Adhikari one who is pretending to be compassionate Pretending to be friendly, pretending to be forgiving? Is he pretending to be always satisfied? Is he pretending to be free of expectations? Is he pretending to be completely neutral? not bothered about those that are dear to him, or friends, or family, and even enemies. Is it just someone who puts on a great act, wears a wonderful mask, and behaves alike toward friend or foe. 
And when he's feeling cold, he pretends he's not feeling cold. And when he's feeling too hot, he doesn't admit that he's feeling too hot. Is this the ideal student or seeker? No, of course not. Such a one is known as a Mithyachari. These beautiful qualities that have been described must flow naturally and spontaneously. If these qualities do not flow naturally and spontaneously are just a mask, then such a one is a Mithyachari and is even further away from the truth than any other normal person. Any other normal person is at least authentic as being himself. But such a one who is pretending is far away from the truth. The beloved of the Lord, on the other hand, has a naturally pure mind. And from this pure mind flow positive qualities, sattvic nature, a pure one-pointed mind. This is the one who is beloved of the Lord. Many of us do have some of these qualities, perhaps not all of them. But some of them, maybe only in a small measure, but we are so influenced by our surroundings, we are so caught up in trying to live up to the expectations of others or get distracted by what others expect from you, that you have no time to contemplate on your own pure qualities and allow them to manifest. You may have noticed in yourself sometimes that in certain areas <clears throat> you are genuinely wanting to do something good. You don't expect a reward. If you are walking on the streets and a stranger asks you for directions, you are happy to help a stranger and you feel good about that. You have done something small, however, it may be still something that helps others. You do not expect any reward for that. And if we magnify this, many of us like to do small little things, but find ourselves hesitating. Should I help? Should I offer my help? If you see a mother with two or three small children who is struggling, maybe at the train station or at the airport, you, you hesitate to offer your help. Why? Why? Because she may refuse your help. And so we tend to block our own positive qualities. We don't allow them to be expressed. Well, these may seem like very small and significant things. They are not. Because in many areas, unconsciously, we are afraid of allowing these positive qualities to manifest. We are afraid of rejection. We are afraid that our help is not required. Maybe the ego gets a little bit involved, but all the same, even if it is, even if it is involved, it is important 
to allow the positive qualities to express themselves. When you allow this to happen, it is like a wellspring of water. If you don't drink from that water, if you don't share that water, that water becomes stagnant and still. But if you drink from that water, you share that water, that water remains fresh and gives life. So these are our positive qualities that we must learn to share and to encourage. And in this way, we strengthen these qualities and evolve. So, any questions so far? Any comments, doubts? Okay, in that case, if you all are in deep thought, you can think of some of your positive qualities when you have some time to contemplate this evening before you go to bed. Contemplate on some of your positive qualities that you can strengthen, that you can encourage. It's a nice little exercise to do. Uh, just a question over here. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned about uh, positive qualities and, and strengthening them. Uh, at the same time, we uh, also have uh, negative qualities. Yes. And uh, isn't that uh, expressing of a negative quality a natural way and an authentic way of, of behavior? Yes. Um, of course, if you are angry at somebody and you suppress that anger that is not that is not authentic and so of course that is not natural that's not spontaneous and you can express that anger the question is how you express that negative quality you don't have to be especially mean or nasty but you can say to somebody if you have a different opinion for example you can express your opinion in a, in a healthy manner, in a not in necessarily hurtful manner. So we try to find a balance between ahimsa and satya. So expressing the qualities that we have is part of being natural, is part of satya. But at the same time, one does not have to be nasty about it. Here, I was referring, of course, to those positive qualities that we have, but we hesitate to, to let them be manifested. If you are nice to somebody, imagine a teenager. You know, some teenagers, when they're in a group, uh, imagine that they, they see an old person crossing the road. You know, even if one of them would really genuinely want to go and help this old person cross the road, he or she probably will not because he's with his teenage friends and it's somehow uncool to do that. So the emphasis here was to learn to encourage and strengthen these positive qualities to allow them to manifest even though sometimes our surroundings do not encourage that or internally we, we have our doubts, we, we are afraid of being rejected. So if that old person would, would reject your help, you know, your offer of help, you somehow, you feel a little bit silly, you know. And, and this experience then 
prevents you from maybe offering your help a second time. And that's learned behavior. These are some scars and we learn that over time. And so here the suggestion is also allow that which is good in you to come forward. It does not mean you suppress that which is negative. That's not what I said. That's not what is implied. Okay, so I hope that was clear. We go on to now the next chapter, which is chapter 13. As I mentioned the last time, that the next few chapters are not very long. Um, this is in fact even one of the longer ones with I think 35 verses, but the following chapters are all rather short, some of them with 25 verses or so. And the only really long chapter which will now come is the very last one. So it is quite possible that it may seem that we are going very fast. You know, if I do a chapter a day, it doesn't mean that we are just skipping over things. It's merely because the chapters are now quite short. So chapter 13 is called Shetra Shetra Ja Vibhag Yoga. That sounds like quite a mouthful. Shetra comes from the Sanskrit and means field. For example, the very famous battlefield where the Mahabharat, the battle of the Mahabharat took place, was known as Kuruk Shetra. So it means the battlefield of the Mahabharata took place on this ground called Kurukshetra and Shetra means field. So this chapter is called Shetra, Shetra Jnana Vibhagi Yoga. So what is Shetra Jnan? Shetra Jnan means the knowledge of the field. What is the field? Is this here referring to battlefield? No. Here, the field is your field of experience, this playground. Your field of experience is everything, the world and the body. The body itself is the field, but not just the body, even the mind. And the entire world around you is the Kshetra. And Kshetra Chyan is the one who knows this field. To know here means the one who is experiencing, the experiencer or the knower of the field. So basically it is referring to Prakriti and Purusha or Shiva and Shakti. Both of them come together and create this world. One without the other means no world. And vibhag means analysis, means division, means distinction. To be able to tell between that which is part of the kshetra and that which is part or which is the Shetra Jaya. To distinguish between the self and the non-self. That is what this chapter deals with. In all the previous chapters, we have gone gradually from Samkhya, philosophy, understood the path of karma, the margas of jhana, raja. We even touched upon kundalini, the experience of it, the, like touching a fire. And we spoke about bhakti, 
this longing, this beautiful bhava known as ananya bhava. We understood from the Bhagavad Gita so far that there are different paths, different ways leading to the same, to the highest. And bhakti is that devotion which comes out at the end. It's like nectar which comes to the surface that you experience eventually. All this leads to mastery of both the worlds, that of the Kshetra, the field, as well as of the Kshetra Jyan, that is consciousness or the knower. Meditators <clears throat> learn to become citizens of both the worlds, the material world as well as the spiritual world. of matter as well as consciousness, of worldly experience as well as spiritual experience. So in this chapter, we understand how to distinguish between the two and then gain mastery over both, to synthesize both. It's the beauty of the Bhagavad Gita. It does not reject the world. It's a very poor enlightenment. If you have to put yourself in a little cave somewhere in the cold heart of the Himalayas and the moment somebody appears there, you, you, you fall from, from your higher state of consciousness. <clears throat> it's a very poor kind of enlightenment. It is, in fact, none. It is being established in the self that you learn that, in fact, even this world is all permeated with consciousness and we cannot reject it. So we learn to be masters in both the world as well as the internal as well as external worlds. So verses 1 and 2 from chapter 13. Arjuna said, I wish to know your primordial nature, Prakriti, and your conscious principle, Purusha, Field and the field knower, knowledge and the knowable, O Krishna. The Blessed Lord said, O son of Kunti, this body is called a field. He who knows this, him the expert in this matter, call the field knower. It is a tradition in all scriptures, that in a scripture, the very first chapter or the very first verse summarizes what is to follow. In a sense, these two verses summarize this entire chapter. Put very simply, the body is called the field or shetra. And the one who knows him, this field, who really knows this field, is called the field knower. So, very simple explanation. Nothing esoteric about it. When you understand the importance of body, you will not abuse your body anymore. The body, this physical body that you have, 
is a great treasure, a great gift. You've seen a newborn baby, it's born naked, no? it's not got clothes, it doesn't have any belongings, nothing it has. The only thing it has is, is a body. That's all you come with, this body. So, it's a great, great treasure that you have. And a healthy body and help you manifest your desires in this extended field of the world. Without a healthy body, you cannot really live out your samskaras, your desires. And that is why we need to look after our body with great love and expressing gratitude for the fact that you have one. Even if your body is not healthy, you still have one. And that too is a great gift. The verses 3 and 4 are related very much to verses 1 and 2. So I shall just continue. If anybody um, needs to say something, of course you can say so. But if not, I shall just continue. Know me, O descendant of Bharata. As the field nova in all fields, that which is the knowledge of the field and of the field nova, I hold that to be true knowledge. What that field is, of what kind, causing what products, produced from what, and of what power and effect it is, hear that from me briefly. In these verses, Krishna explains that true knowledge is the knowledge of the field and the field knower, that is of Kshetra and Kshetrajya. True knowledge of the self and not self, which means learning to distinguish between these two. That is true knowledge. Anything else is ignorance. If you don't know the difference between these two, then you are ignorant. If you confuse not self for self, it is called ignorance, avidya. This is how it is defined in the Yoga Sutras. Sri Krishna then says, we should understand this field. We should understand what it is comprised of. Analyze it. What, what is it made up of and what does it produce? What are its products? Which means what we need is a comprehensive knowledge of the nature of the world and the universe around us. We need to have an overview of who we are, how <clears throat> we came to this world, what is our role in this world, what is the nature of this world. All these things <clears throat> are covered by Sri Krishna. And this is something that any good seeker must understand. He should or she should have a comprehensive knowledge of self and not self and learn to distinguish between these two. This is the function of buddhi. The swan is a mythical yogic 
um, creature or symbol. The swan is also the symbol of the Himalayan tradition. Of at Sadhana Mandir, you see there are two swans. <clears throat> what is the symbolism behind that? The swan is known to have the power to separate milk and water. When you mix milk and water, normally you cannot separate the two, right? It's all mixed together and it looks one. How do you remove the water now from the milk? Well, swans can do that. <laughs> That's just a legend. It's a myth. Uh, it's a mythology. But it is a symbol of buddhi. Buddhi becomes so fine, so subtle, that with such a fine buddhi, you can distinguish between the self and the non-self. Like a swan can separate water and milk. Any comments or questions so far? Good, then we continue to verses 5 to 7. Verses 5 to 7 explain the nature of the world, what it is made up of. It gives us this comprehensive knowledge that Sri Krishna spoke about in the earlier verse. As sung of by the sages variously and by many fold Vedic mantras in different ways as well as by the words of the sutras that teach about Brahman and that are definitive and logical. The five great elements, ego, intelligence, and the unmanifest, the ten and one senses, as well as the five pastures of the senses. Desire, aversion, pleasure, pain, the whole organism, awareness, sustenance. This is illustrated briefly as the field together with its products. So this, this has been explained in the Vedas and the Upanishads and by the Sutras, the Brahma Sutras. And it is expounded here as well. The world is made up of five great elements, the Bhutas. And these are Earth, water, fire, air, and space. These are the five great elements. Ego is Ahankara. Intelligence, that is Buddhi. It's part of the Antakarna. The ten and one senses, these are Ten senses, the active and the uh, cognitive senses, as well as manas. Here, manas is included as one of the senses. And the reason is that manas is the coordinator of the senses. So, in a sense, you can, you can also say it, it is kind of like one of the indriyas or one of the senses. So, this includes the Antakarana. All this leads to desire and aversion. You can also call it Ragadvesha, attachment and aversion. It leads to pleasure and pain. It leads to awareness and sustenance. So awareness is self. And sustenance is the body which needs to be sustained. So 
it leads again to duality. So what is the product of all this? Duality. This world is the result. Prakriti it is known as. So this list, what we talked about just now, is known as tattvas. Tattva actually means quality. And this comes from Sankhya philosophy or Sankhya metaphysics where all these are enumerated. The universe around us was analyzed just as a physicist analyzes the universe and came to the conclusion the chemist uh, for their, said that there are, there are so many elements in the uh, periodic table and the physicist said, yes, it's, each element is made up of atoms, protons, neutrons and other small little elements, of, uh, atomic elements. So just as modern science studied matter and came to the conclusion that these were the building blocks of the universe, the Samkhya yogis studied also the universe around them and this is how they saw the universe made up of building blocks of the Bhutas, the Tanmantras, the Indriyas, the Antakarna, finally leading to the unmanifest, the Avyakta or Prakruti, and of course, ultimately, pure consciousness itself, unmanifest form. These verses are good to know, even if you don't understand everything, even if you can't really remember everything. It's good to have this information so you know how the world progresses from the gross, which is the mutas, to the subtler, Aspects such as the Indriyas and the Antakarna to the subtle most, which is the manifest self. Any questions about the Tattvas? In that case, we continue verses 8 to 12. Absence of self-praise, freedom from hypocrisy, non-violence, forgiveness, simplicity, service to the teacher, purity, stillness, self-control, a dispassionate attitude toward the objects of the senses, as well as the absence of ego, observing the flow of painfulness in birth, age, death and illness, freedom from attraction, freedom from attachment towards progeny, spouse, home and so forth, and ever remaining even-minded when confronted with desirables or undesirables undeviating devotion towards me with single-minded yoga, fondness for solitary places, not delighting in gatherings of people, always dwelling in spiritual knowledge, insight into the meaning of true nature. This is said to be knowledge. Other than this is ignorance. Once again, the, this particular chapter enumerates some qualities that it considers to be important on the path of 
spiritual development or evolution. If you analyze this carefully and ask yourself, how many of these qualities do you have? Absence of self-praise? Are you inclined to praise yourself? Some people do, they are not very modest. Sometimes it's also a cultural aspect, but it has become a habit for some. They like to praise themselves, show off, show off their titles, show off their degrees, show off uh, their cars, <laughs> or show off um, their clothes, talent. There are so many things. So self-praise is uh, manifesting in a lot of people in different ways. Can you reflect on yourself and say, okay, I do that sometimes and become more aware of it in you. Freedom from hypocrisy. Well, there are a lot of people who are hypocrites they say something, but they mean something else. You know, there is no coordination between what they think and what they do. So they may say wonderful things, but they're doing something else. This, especially here in the spiritual development, is considered to be a, a great um, um, obstacle because it is very important for a seeker to be authentic. How authentic are you? Is a question that you should ask yourself and try to be authentic. But at the same time, be non-violent. Are you an aggressive, mean, hurtful person? Do you hurt people with your honesty or otherwise, something to reflect on. Forgiveness, simplicity, are you able to forgive easily? Or do you keep that in your heart and you keep brooding about it on and on? And the person may have forgotten about it, what he did, but you don't. You keep it in your heart and it always bothers you. Simplicity, Service to the teacher, purity, stillness, self-control, all these are qualities that are sought in a spiritual seeker. Do you have a dispassionate mind towards the objects of the senses? Some people are very, very attached to things. As a, you know, a harmless little example is that... Um, Sometimes people get very attached to things like books. If you have a book and somebody borrows your book and has not returned it, then it keeps brooding in your mind and every time you know you meet the person, you say, oh, please return my book. <laughs> and that becomes a kind of a obsession. You know? It's not a very valuable thing, but it becomes an obsession. So these objects, maybe of course, some are small, but there may be bigger objects like... Um, cars or, or houses or, and your attachment to it. It's not easy to be um, dispassionate about some of these objects. We do tend to get sentimental about certain things. If you have grown up in a certain house, you may be having a very deep emotional connection with that. It's got memories. So, <clears throat> this shows your level of progress. Do you feel your ego sometimes? Sometimes it, it bothers you. You know, you don't like it either. But you feel so helpless because that ego has such a control over you. You want to get rid of it. But somehow you're helpless. And you feel your ego comes in places and doesn't let you enjoy your life. In relationships, very often, you see this in families. 
between partners and I must say very often that it is the male ego which is, tends to be a little bit more dominant and a little bit more powerful and um, this comes in a lot. Women develop another kind of ego. They have to work very hard to prove themselves and so women have to compensate and for that they also end up developing very strong character traits which can also be called ego. Are you able to observe this painful process of birth, getting old, getting sick, understanding that the body is vulnerable, the body is it's not a machine of, you know, even machines uh, break down, so uh, the body needs to be looked after, suffers from disease, and then begins to wear down, until finally you have old age and eventually death. It's a, a big one. <laughs> not many of us are probably able to observe this, really, primarily because most of this happens over longer period of time but if you can contemplate on this then it is quite awe-inspiring just contemplate if you make a little collection of your photos from the time you were a child you became a a young you know from a baby to a child to a teenager a young adult to a more mature person and you put these photos together you know make a kind of a collage it's quite fascinating to see that you see the march of time and the flow of of life here you cannot hold it still it, if you try to hold it still it becomes stagnant that's not life. That's death. Most of us have attraction and attachment as well as whether it is to spouse, spouse or to, to the home, to the children. But there is always. It's very difficult to remain equanimous when confronted with, with these things. So that's another a very um, strong aspect in all of us, attachment to family, to friends. The one who has got these positive qualities is very devoted to pure consciousness, the Atman, with a, with a single-mindedness that we call Ananya Bhava. Ananya means single-minded. You only think of that and nothing else. Such a person likes to be alone, doesn't like to be in crowds. He's happy on his own. He's not lonely. It's not loneliness. It is Finding deep joy, love, and a sense of connection with actually everything and everybody around you that you don't feel lonely anymore. And you don't enjoy gatherings of people primarily because the people are always um, busy with worldly things. And so when you're in company of worldly people, such a person uh, is just obviously not very comfortable there. Such a person dwells in spiritual knowledge and experiences a kind of intoxication, soma, amrit, 
so it's called and this is this insight into his or her own true nature this is true knowledge anything else is ignorance so we went a little bit further detail into these qualities since it's been repeated actually right in the beginning of this chapter also we talked about it or sorry the end of the last chapter i think it was and now once again here because these qualities are important they can be encouraged they can be promoted it does not mean you're fake or hypocrite but you can try to promote these qualities <clears throat> Any questions, thoughts, comments, doubts about these? The next few verses, verses um, thirteen to seventeen. these describe the qualities of brahman so earlier we described the qualities of the kshetra the field and now it is describing the nature of the qualities of the kshetra jnan that is the knower that which is the worthy object of knowledge i shall teach you knowing which one attains immortality it is beginningless supreme brahman which is said to be neither existent nor non-existent with hands and feet in all directions with eyes heads and faces in all directions having ears everywhere he dwells covering everything in the world appearing as though having attributes of all the senses yet devoid of all senses unattached yet bearer of all free of gunas yet receiver of gunas immobile yet moving inside and outside beings unknowable because of its subtlety it dwells far and is near undivided in the beings yet remaining as though divided bearer of all the beings is that object of knowledge the consumer and also the creator very powerful verses which seem to speak in riddles or paradoxes so we find a lot of almost contradictory statements it is existent nor non-existent it seems to to have senses yet devoid of senses moving yet unmoving divided yet undivided when we contemplate on this it seems for a moment that you know the mind cannot grasp it and it seems to stop for 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 a bit it's like it's jammed you know there are so many thoughts and you're trying to process these contradictory thoughts and the and the thoughts all sort of get jammed and you can't think just for a brief moment maybe for maybe even just for a second you can't think there are no thoughts and that is the objective of these verses that you attain even if it is only for a brief second that state of utter peace that is thoughtless in that moment it shines forth 
you get a glimpse of it. Because any attempt to describe it seems to fall short. So many traditions of the world spoke in riddles. Jesus spoke in parables, riddles. Zen Kwan's are very paradoxical. Whenever we try to describe that pure consciousness, we struggle for words. And it actually sounds like nonsense. Nonsense. Doesn't make much sense. It's beyond logic. It's beyond that which makes sense. It's beyond the mind. And that is why we, we don't quite get it. It's only when we have a direct insight, glimpse of that which was never born and should never die, is eternal and immortal, that we begin to realize that it's very difficult to share this experience, describe that which is beyond the mind. So while pure consciousness is always remains undivided, yet it gives the appearance of being divided. You are a different individual from me. We seem to be separate. Yet there is something deep inside that connects us and makes us all one. whole world is living. Okay, I would like to stop here. And uh, it's a uh, been a very uh, thought-provoking session also from an individual point of view. There are things that you can contemplate about, some of these qualities. And of course, um, the last verses were also very powerful. And uh, it's a good point for us to stop the session. We will continue, of course, uh, next Friday. Hope to see you all again. Do you have any questions, anybody, about these last verses? Yeah, I thought not. <laughs> Mostly these, these last verses leave you kind of shell shocked. And so Yes, we stop here in that case and uh, have a nice um, weekend, everybody. And we see you again next week, same time. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, bye, everyone.